Right. Well, I think we'll um, we'll start with it being the last session of uh, the conference. So, welcome to session forty-two, which is fact or fiction: the power of communities with knowledge of their past. Um, slight change to the running order, um, just so everyone's aware. Um, Claire um, from University of York is going to speak after the break. So the only difference will be, smaller than it, but the tea break will be um, here, not there. So the running order is the same. Um, the, the finish time will be the same, broadly. Um, and we're okay for, for time in terms of questions and so on, so we, we don't have any particular pressure on us there. Um, just to let you know, um, a couple of uh, apologies for absence. Harold, who's my colleague at York, isn't here. And Hillary, um, who's the first speaker, isn't here. So I'm Hillary for the day. Um, that's probably reflects what us on me even there. Um, I'm just going to read Hillary's presentation out. She sent a couple of images, but it's a um, sort of a narrative account of, of her presentation. So I'll be reading it verbatim. Um, you can ask me some questions if you like, <laughs> um, but I'll probably just pass you this <laughs> afterwards. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I think it, it should be an interesting session. We will um, be flexible because I, I don't know if you knew initially this was going to be a round table discussion and we're going to do it in a mixed format. So people will do a little position paper and then take Q and A's and we'll do it on a kind of a rolling basis. So we're not going to be rigid about people not taking questions. If people want to take questions, that's fine. If you want to ask questions, that's also fine um, after the individual session and then um, we'll see how it goes for the day, if anyone needs to get off, but we'll, we'll have a general Q&A, probably just before the break, and then at the close of business as well. So so that's what we're going to do. Um, I think you meant to do housekeeping, so there are no fire alarms planned, so if there's a fire alarm, follow me out of there. Um, and I think everyone obviously knows where the lifts and so on are. Um, is everyone okay with the light levels and so on? Because I know I don't want to trigger anyone's um, light level deep incidents or anything. So we're all okay with that, yeah? Right, good. I don't think there's any flashing images or anything like that, so I think that's the health and safety dealt with. Um, so as I say, I'm going to read this um, from Hillary's piece. Um, and just before that, I would just say that when Harold and I initially talked about doing this session, we had some core questions um, that were put out there in the call for papers and that we just wanted to form, um, in a fairly loose way, the way people wanted to discuss their case studies and their, their projects. So um, when I was doing my undergrad uh, project, just, just by way of an example, uh, one of the cases I looked at was a small um, funded project north of Manchester, um, so 200 miles north of here, um, about a, a town called Royton, Royton Hall, um, which was a, a building that exists now just in, in profile in some grass. It, it was demolished in the, the uh, 1960s. And it was one of those projects that, that justified its existence partly through the HLF and partly through uh, en engagement with the community and with a local school, two local schools actually. Uh, so it's funded on that basis. And of course, projects like that are, are worthwhile because it's preservation by record and, and it was it had never been properly excavated. It was just demolished. It was an old 15th, 16th century manor house in effect. Um, and it occurred to me that the, the, the community elements of the funding for that justification was was a bit dubious, I, I, I felt. No, it shouldn't have been done. The project was great. The, the record's good. It was really well executed. But I felt there's a, a sort of a disconnect, if you like, between how how that project had to fund itself by making claims for the, the community and the outreach work that was done and, and the reality of what happened. So I went to the two primary schools that were taken there and nobody knew anything about it. The teachers barely knew anything about it. And the children certainly didn't. And North Manchester is not a t tourist hotspot, sadly, but it isn't. Um, <laughs> much, much like dilapidated, dilapidated mills. And um, so, so I was thinking, well, who's the community? And it, it's in the middle of a big ex-council estate. So I'll never forget, I knocked on 92 doors and I asked, I think I got 88 responses. And um, the building was called Royton Hall. And, and there, there are now information boards there and, and it say it's a gravel outline just outside the town centre. Quite a pro high profile dig at the time. So primary schools are there, they had open days and so on. And uh, it's bounded by Hall Street uh, in Royton. And I'm going to say there's information boards there. And I didn't find anyone who knew what the building was called on this estate. Like, just, just they knew the place was there because the kids play football on there, people walk their dogs on there. Um, and I had all these ambitious questions about did you go, did you participate, what are your lasting memories, and all the usual things. And I ended up just saying, you know what it was called? No. Have you read the information boards? No. 
Uh, you ever go there or utilize it now? And it was really, really um, not disappointing. It, it, in a way, it wasn't surprising because they were the community that that place was in, but they weren't the community that were particularly interested in that place. That was a friends group that kind of, you know, the healthy and the wealthy who traveled into the area to do that project. And that's fine. And it's not a criticism of the project, but you think, well, who is the community? You know, who's the, who's the HLF at that time funding that project for? Because it wasn't that community. There's no tourism. The schools didn't know. And I think Nate will touch on, on why that may be later on. Um, so it just makes you think, well, are we, as a sector, pitching an idea of, of community and, and, and of the funding merits for things like HLF that actually is not a fiction because there's some brilliant outreach stuff goes on, but it, it's not always as it seems, you know. And as I said, that isn't to denigrate the project, but it does make you wonder when you read the validations and the the, the, the write-ups afterwards about the outcomes, how how accurate that is. If the children don't know about it, the people who live near it don't know about it, and nobody ever goes there, it, it's hard to justify on that, those terms, you know, which is an argument for changing the funding model, not not, not doing the work, if you see what I mean. Um, so it was a conversation about that place, with Harold, and then we were talking about, well, of course, if you think about place and identity and your kind of all those things that people take from, from their heritage, if you're completely oblivious to your heritage for whatever reason, you won't have a sense of place and it won't add to your to your feeling of identity. So we were thinking we would ask that those kind of questions, um, which is kind of what point number three is about, you know, the prime directive for that. Really shouldn't I'd feel be entangled with kind of a full educational visit for some children who are taken there, kind of run around for a bit. And are taken away again. Um, that's to me that isn't really outreach. Um, so that's kind of the, the history of this um, session.